everyone. So I'm Crystal Kelly and in today's video I have been posting about working with hot blooded horses and I've been getting a lot of really interesting questions about that. So I thought in today's video I could talk about hot horses and maybe even hot versus lazy horses. So if you have any questions around that feel free at any time to just drop it into the comments and I'm going to try and answer them as I go. Um, I might even save the questions in the comments towards the very end like if I'm in the middle of something. Um, and if you have questions which are related to other topics, you know, not necessarily about hot blooded horses or, you know, energetic horses or lazy horses, then also feel free to drop it into the chat there for me. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, actually, so I have my whiteboard again, so I want to kind of draw something and demonstrate for you guys. But before I dive into that, let me just, for those of you have, who haven't actually seen the post that I shared, so basically what I was discussing is the concept of how to actually properly ride a hot horse. Now, by a hot horse, what I mean is a very energetic horse, you know, a, a little ball of fire that just wants to go, 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 very forward thinking, very active, very energetic, doesn't know how to stand still, okay, something like that, okay, that's what I mean by a hot horse. Now, obviously, there are certain breeds which are more hot-blooded, you know, for example, I have an Arabian, and we also have a Thoroughbred. Both of these are pretty hot-blooded uh, by nature. And so I, I actually was sharing a story about my Thoroughbred mare. She's an off-the-track Thoroughbred mare. And when we first went to, to look at her, okay, so we didn't own her yet. I actually, I saw an ad, I think, on Facebook, and there was just something about her that sparked my interest, and I was already kind of hunting for a horse to buy for my husband, and there was just something about her. So I went to go see her, and so first of all, I want to say she is an off-the-track thoroughbred. So she was a racer, but she was always dead last, okay? And I mean dead last. Like, she came in last all races that she did, okay? Every single race she was last, or maybe second to dead last. Um, so she was a pretty horrible racehorse. And and the funny thing is, is she's actually not lazy at all, okay? She's not slow. But when I went to go and see her to buy her, I did actually notice something. And the untrained eye might have actually have thought that she might even be like lame, okay? So that was one of the first things. Like we made sure she had a clean bill of health and that she was physically actually okay. Um, but the way that she moved, so what happened was the lady, you know, she wanted to demonstrate for us Q, that's her name, Q. She wanted to demonstrate for us Q and kind of the amount of work that she's been doing with her. So first she put her on a little lunge line and just let Q trot around. And Q, it was like, like she couldn't move, you know, like her, her joints were stuck and she just was kind of scooting along um, in the arena. I mean, her legs were like flailing around. I mean, she was, I think four or five at that time. Like she should know where to put her legs, but she just like had no control of her body and she was flat, like scooting around, but also very speedy. Um, and she just like, she just couldn't move. Okay. It looked almost like horrible to watch, to be honest. And, and then the lady went to, you know, saddle her and, and actually ride her around in the arena to demonstrate for me how, how calm she was. And, and by calm, I mean, you know, obviously she's not bucking or rearing or doing obviously naughty things like that. So the lady, she goes to get on and in the same, you know, like when Q was being lunged, when the lady went to ride her, it's almost like you couldn't move, even walk. She was taking like these short little steps and she's a, she's a big girl. She's 16, one hands high. Okay. She's very leggy, very athletic looking, um, but she almost couldn't like walk. She just was really stick, stuck and sticky in her movements. And she seemed really like tense and, um, you know, like her shoulders wasn't, there wasn't like a swing in her step or something. Her head was in the air and she was just kind of, you know, like looking around and um, yeah, anyway, so that was kind of our starting point with Q. <laughs> so I, I bought her, <laughs> I bought her even when she looked like that. Um, actually, I, I kind of sort of determined that the reason that she was doing that was actually not Q. Okay, the reason that she was moving like that was actually because the riders, the people who were riding her and her owner, was basically hanging on her face, was hanging on the reins. Okay, it was like a novice rider. I don't know why she had an off the track thoroughbred, but it was a novice rider. She was clearly very nervous of the fact that Q is a big girl, like she's 16 one hands, and her strides are naturally very big. And so this girl was just used to just hanging on the reins and just kind of cruising around while like just keeping the horse back. And although Q was kind of able to trot or able to canter, she just couldn't fully step into the trot or fully step into the canter. So I sort of determined, um, you know, 
it was sort of rider related issues, training issues. So I, I bought her. We bought Q. That's my husband's horse. We've had her for three years now. And um, if you were to see Q's dressage nowadays, I mean, it's like a totally different horse, to be honest. So the reason that I wanted to bring up the topic of hot horses is because there is a lot of misconceptions out there about, you know, if you're on a hot horse, you shouldn't put your legs on them. Or if you're on a hot horse, you know, you have to hold them back, you know, don't let them bolt or take off with you. And, and that's, that's not the case. So in the example of Q, you know, after I think about a week of working with her, it didn't take very long to be honest, but after about a week of working with her, getting her to stretch and relax and actually, you know, take big sweeping steps. So those are actually more comfortable steps for her. Um, after about a week, she was, she was fine and she could actually move and she wasn't so stuck anymore. And, you know, when you are working with these hot horses, um, they usually have a tendency, it, it kind of gets worse if you try and like contain them, if you try and control them. So that is one of the biggest mistakes that I see people making with these hot blooded horses is that they try to control the horse and they don't direct the horse's energy. And my other horse, Lily, she's going to be the perfect example of this one. <laughs> she is a little fireball, a little ball of energy. Um, she's a 14-2 Arabian part Arabian mare and um she's you know I, I I like to joke that she's Californian because she's got things to do places to go people to see so yeah she she's a she's a a lot of laugh I, I obviously I enjoy riding her um but she's very you know forward she wants to go she's got things to do you know and um so a lot of people with a horse like that they're actually nervous or they're frightened and so because of that they, without even realizing, okay, it's usually subconscious behaviors here, but they take their legs off of the horse's belly and then they pull on the reins, okay, or they hang on the reins or they hang on the horse or they grip with their knees or they grip with their upper legs, okay, they're doing all of these things which actually causes our horses to be more tense and so our horses can get more and more hollow, like their heads will come up, um, you know, their legs are flailing and although it feels like they're going speedy, like their legs are flailing, they're actually not really moving, you know, they're not really going forward anywhere. So there's a big difference between a horse which is actually like moving freely which is actually like stepping through and carrying itself so you know if the horse is stepping bigger steps a horse can actually have bigger strides without actually speeding up okay and this is something you know in show jumping or dressage we use quite a lot okay you can actually extend the horse um let's say i have two jumps and in the first jump i need to bring the horse back after i jump it so that I can make it over the second jump, or maybe the distance is a bit further. So I need to land one jump and then kind of speed up, not necessarily speed up, but extend the stride a little bit to make it over the second jump. So you can actually lengthen the horse's stride or compress the horse's stride without actually changing the rhythm or the, um, the speed of the horse, okay? So, you know, you need to kind of take that misconception out of your head that just because they're taking bigger steps doesn't mean that they're necessarily faster. Um, so, I want to show on the whiteboard, um, you know, this kind of concept of, of where our legs should be and everything. But first, let me just see um, in the chat. So Kara says, thank you for addressing this topic further. So thank you, Kara. I'm, I'm happy. And, and remember, you guys, at any point can can leave your um, your questions into the chat. I'm totally happy to answer them, even if it's like totally off topic. So let me go ahead and share the whiteboard. Uh, just give me one second to share my my screen here um, because what I want to do is share. Okay, so this is my little whiteboard here. I'm just gonna pick a random color. So let's say this is my horse's belly, okay? It's ears and this is the rider's legs and their boot, yeah? So that is my rider riding on their horse. So, and that's their tail. So what I want to point out is a lot of riders, when they're on a hot horse, they kind of take their leg off of the horse, okay? I'll just erase this one. So they take their leg off of the horse, okay? They're so worried about the horse, um, about their leg touching the horse's belly, that they ride with their leg like a mile away from the horse. And the reason that this is actually a huge problem, okay, this is like one of the biggest mistakes that you can do. And the reason is if your leg even accidentally brushes the belly of the horse, then pew, they're gonna like take off like a rocket. 
okay? Because they haven't had any contact and all of a sudden they have contact, they're either gonna bolt, they're gonna take off, uh, they're gonna get anxious, their head's gonna come up, they're gonna hollow their backs, they're gonna, their legs are gonna start flailing. Like they're gonna be very stressed, very tense because here they were cruising around, you know, without a care in the world. And then all of a sudden, boom, you kind of put their, your leg on them. Um, let's go ahead and erase this. So that is one of the, the worst things that you can do. Um, the other thing is squeezing with your with your knees. So, you know, again, here's our horse. Boop, 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 boop. Beautiful horse. Okay. So when we're riding, so this is my rider. Yep, they're riding. I know this is a terrible picture. Um, but if, if we're riding, if you start squeezing with your knees um, or with your ankles, if you start just gripping on the horse anywhere in your legs, okay, what it's going to do is it's actually going to affect our seat, okay? It's going to lock our seat. So what happens is, and I'll stop sharing for a second. So what happens when we lock our seat? Okay, so let's take the example of the fetal position. <gasps> Like we lean forward, we're pulling on our reins and, you know, suddenly we're forward, our legs are locked. So what happens is our seat physically cannot move, okay? It's it's very limited in its ability to move with the horse. So you're on a hot horse, okay? It's taking big steps, big strides, and all of a sudden you've squeezed with your legs, which by the way, squeezing means what? Go, go faster, right? So you're squeezing with your legs and now your seat is locked and the horse is taking big steps and you're not able to move with them. So that is why, you know, riders, they they panic. They feel like they're gonna fall off. It's probably because they can fall off because their seat's not moving with their horse. Um, they feel like their horse is out of control. Like, oh, my horse might bolt at any moment. Well, that's because actually you're chasing the horse to go even faster with that restricted movement of your seat because you're not able to actually move with them then you are actually chasing them and you're sort of encouraging them with your seat, even though your hands might be pulling back, like, whoa, whoa, your seat is actually chasing them, telling them to go faster. And that's why the hot horses, you know, they'll get really tense, really nervous, really excited. They might start huffing and puffing. Um, they might get a little bit spooky, a little bit squirrely. And it's really, it's just because they have all of this pent up energy. You're trying to contain them. You're trying to restrict them. You're trying to basically silence them. And now, you know, you're doing all the things wrong, like chasing them, telling them to go, but at the same time, telling them to whoa. And they just don't know what to listen to. They're like, am I listening to the stop? Am I trying to go? Like, does she want me to run? Like, what's, what's happening here? Okay, and a hot horse is more likely to go um, and go faster than it is to just, you know, walk casually. So if you're on that type of horse, that's, that's one of the worst things you could do because you've now just basically given them permission to, to run. So... What we need to do as riders is we need to learn, we need to learn how to ride, okay? That's like, like the simple answer. We need to just learn how to ride. We need to ride what our horses are giving us. And I'm gonna use an example. So I, I did do um, a race in Mongolia, um, the Mongol Derby. Some of you might've heard of this. It's a thousand kilometers, 35 different um, semi-wild Mongolia ponies. And anyways, when I did that race, so, you know, it's like, I think I did it in 10 days or something like that, um, over a thousand kilometers on these horses. And I personally, like, I love fast horses. Okay. That's my personality. So I would pull up to a horse station and I would ask the Mongolian guy, like, give me your fastest horse, please. And basically I would check my GPS to see which direction I wanted to go before I got on, because I knew as soon as I got on these horses, pew, they were gone. Okay. And there's no stopping them. They're going to run for about 40 kilometers, full speed gallop up mountains, marshes, ditches, like whatever, crossing rivers. They don't care. They don't stop. They just keep going. And um, so, you know, you have to just ride it. You cannot for 40 kilometers fight with a horse, try and pull on it, its face, try and fuss with the horse. And I will say that, you know, the year that I did it, I think 48 people started and only 22 actually finished the race. And I was one of the ones that finished. And I can say one of the things, like, I think one of the reasons that I actually finished the race and a lot of really amazing riders didn't is because they were used to riding these like first world kind of arena horses. And the difference is, you know, in an arena, okay, you know, if the horse takes off with you full speed gallop, I mean, where's it going to go? It's going to go in a circle, okay? It might stop at the gate, but that's like worst case scenario. In a situation like Mongolia, where there's no fences, you need to learn to just stay on and ride it and get out of the horse's way. 
So that's what I did. I would just get on. I kind of would point it in the rough direction of where I wanted it to go. But other than that, I would drop the reins and just let it let it bolt for 40 kilometers, basically. Um, and, you know, we had vet checks at the end of, of the ride. And these horses, I mean, they pulsed down very quickly. Like, they were super fit. This was like a walk in the park for them. Um, but that's what I did. And I did that on three or four horses every single day for 10 days. So, you know, the fact is that, okay, on a first world horse, probably you're not going to be um, galloping in an um, endless, like, trail with mountains and, and rivers and things. Um, but the point is you need to learn how to sort of ride the horse and you have to, you can't influence the horse until you yourself are balanced and able to follow what the horse gives you. So, you know, riding on the lunge line, that is, I think everyone personally, I start all of my students on the lunge line. I think everyone needs to ride on the lunge line. I don't know why there's so many riders that are not riding on a lunge line. Um, so everyone needs to ride on the lunge line, ride on the lunge line, do different exercises, you know, tie the reins in the knot, get rid of the reins, like whatever. Uh, but learn how to follow what the horse gives you. That doesn't mean you just let the horse bolt around in a circle on a lunge line for an hour. No, I, like you need to work with that horse. Make sure you have walk, trot, and canter, and you can make these transitions without reins. Okay, you're lunging. Um, and then, you know, when that horse is safe, then you get on and you do the same thing. You do walk, you do trot, maybe even canter without reins. Um, doing transitions and breathing. So, you know, once you've kind of graduated and you can do that, then you can remove the lunge line and, and actually have reins. Um, and then you just do that in the arena. And then once they're totally relaxed and okay with that, walk, trot, canter, go out on a trail ride with them. Um, go out on a, a new trail ride with them every weekend, like whatever. So that's what you need to do is you need to work on you being able to be balanced and to not do things like gripping with your knees or not um, affecting the horse's motion, their natural movement. And then you need to be able to ride the horse, what the horse is giving you. And then once you've done that, you can start to actually influence your horse. So, you know, even an athletic, like very hot blooded horse, like my little Arabian mare, Lily, uh, she's got things to do, places to go. But when we're walking and I'm on the buckle, she knows she's only allowed to walk. Like she knows she's not allowed to trot at all. So she doesn't. Okay. She might do a speedy walk and I might need to breathe and, you know, like, oh, calm down, Lily. Like we don't, we don't need to go that fast or whatever. I just let her cruise around and walk. Um, but she knows, you know, she's stretching on the buckle and she's relaxed. We're out on the trail in the forest enjoying the nature, unless there's a bear, you know, in which case I would pick up the reins. Um, but she doesn't actually need to go any faster than that. And it's the same thing in trot. So I'm riding her on a trail or an arena or whatever. She'll start trotting. I pick my rhythm. So I will rise to the trot or maybe even sitting trot, depending on what I'm working on. I will choose the rhythm, okay, slower or faster, um, bigger steps, shorter steps, you know, more collection, more working or whatever. And she will match my rhythm. And I should be able to adjust it throughout okay i should be able to do all these different transitions without and i should be able to do that on the buckle as well with my seat and with my breathing same in canter so that is just kind of some of the basics of the difference of working with a hot-blooded horse so hopefully i've helped kind of shatter some of the misconceptions um, about you know not putting your legs on their horse on the horse's belly if they're hot um, and also about how it actually affects, you know, if you're gripping with your knees or if you're hanging on the reins, how it actually affects the horse. So if anyone has any questions, you know, please um, comment them in the chat. Um, yeah, cool. So, yes, um, that is the topic of the hot hot horses and you know i try and do these videos every week um where i answer your questions so definitely you know send me an email um actually let me just show you my email quickly so you know you guys can send me an email and i'm more than happy to answer your questions and then also the other thing that i want to mention i know that in the chat it's very limited because you can only like comment a, a question here or there if you want to join me for a mastermind. I do host weekly private mastermind groups. So, you know, if you want to kind of 
audit one of these masterminds, then basically what I do is you can jump on a Zoom call with me and you know a bunch of others, and then you can ask your questions. We can talk. It's a little discussion. We can talk about you know everyone will kind of share what they're working on and what they're going through, and we can all kind of work together and help each other out. So if that sounds like something that you would be interested in joining me for, like I said, I do that every week as well. Um, that is private, so it's twenty seven dollars for you to audit one of the masterminds. So if that's something you're interested in, again, you can just send me an email here um, or reach out to me on, on Facebook or Instagram or wherever. I'm, I'm pretty easy to find. So yeah, that again, thank you so much for watching. Let me just check if anyone has any other questions. Um, checking the chat there. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you so much. Hopefully you have found this helpful. And hopefully the next time that you go and ride a more hot blooded horse, you will be a little bit more aware of some of the things which you might be doing even subconsciously, you know, you might not actually be aware that that's what you're doing. And then that way you can actually kind of mentally scan your body, you know, and see what it is that you could be doing with your horse to actually help them to relax, help them to stretch, help them to actually trust you. And, and it should be that, you know, it might not happen instantly the first time, but it should be that you can kind of throw your reins away and just ride them around on the buckle. And even though they might be more energetic than, you know, a lazier horse, um, they still know that they're not allowed to break into the next gate. They're not allowed, if you're trotting, and you're on the buckle, they're not allowed to break into canter. So even if they sped up, they would speed up and trot. And then maybe you breathe or you relax or you do a transition and then, you know, bring them back down um, and trot a little bit like a slower trot, but they still don't break into a canter because they kind of have that respect for you and they respect those sort of boundaries. So again, the, the biggest thing that I want you to know is that you need to direct the horse's energy not silence it, okay? Don't try and control their energy. You need to just direct it or redirect it, okay? Make them work, put them into something useful. Um, so Kara, she has a question, let me just see. So I'm struggling with training, um, capturing collection with my hotter horse. She shuts down when I ask for more contact. So thank you, Kara, for sharing that. And um, actually, this is um, interesting that you mentioned that. So my Arabian mare, Lily, when I first started working with her. So she also, she was five and she very hot. Like she's way hotter than my thoroughbred. Okay, Lily is hot, hot, hot. <laughs> okay, she's, she's a little machine. And when I first started working with her, so she was five when I bought her, um, she was so used to kind of doing her own thing. She also had like a novice rider um, person who was used to riding her. So when I started to work with, contact with the reins in the beginning it was almost like she was on fire she was like wah, 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 like her face was just flailing in the air like she didn't know how to cope with contact and i had very soft contact with her um and you know obviously i checked like the bit and you know everything nose band and tack and everything was correct but she just like she didn't know what to do with contact basically and and so uh, sort of similar you know she would sort of shut down and so when I started um, working with her and I wanted to progress her, so we'd already done, I mean, all kinds of stuff on the buckle. I could walk, I could trot, I could canter, I could do transitions all day long on the lunge, off the lunge, riding in the arena, out on the trail, I could do all this stuff. But then when it came time to start working with, you know, the collection and um, kind of leveling up a little bit and actually picking up the reins, um, she definitely started to sort of like, ah, get a little bit tense and hollow out and, and sort of react to that a little bit. So the best thing that I would say for you, um, you know, if, if your horse is a little bit similar, like how I think Lily was acting, um, basically what I did to overcome that was, well, first of all, it's sort of baby steps, okay? It doesn't have to be perfect in one day. I know that Lily loves praise, okay? All horses love praise. But she particularly, like, she's a little diva. She's a little showboat. She loves praise. So praise for her, like, she needs to feel good. She needs to feel important. She needs to feel like she's, you know, in the spotlight. And more so than, than some of my other horses. So what I would do is when I would work with her, even the teeny tiniest bit, okay, even if it's, like, half a microsecond, <laughs> I would praise her, like, like crazy okay i was like oh my god you're the most amazing horse. i've never seen a horse that's amazing like and scratching her and just like really praising her and you know so i might pick up the reins a little bit here i'll go ahead and, and hide this so you can kind of see i might kind of pick up the reins a little bit so i had her stretching i would pick up the reins a little bit and as soon as i felt her starting to like tense or whatever i would have her hold it for a little bit 
and then really praise her. And then again, kind of pick up the, the contact a little bit and then praise her. And I might even do that not in the saddle. I might even do that, you know, when I'm when I'm lunging um, or kind of doing like next to her and leading her, like just kind of putting some some contact and some pressure on her face, which she wasn't used to. Um, not so much pressure, but just just there. Like I'm just there. She can feel me. She can feel that there's something. And so that was something that I used to do as far as like getting her head to actually stretch into my hands. And after a while, she kind of learned that, you know, obviously my my reins weren't hurting her. OK, she wasn't in any discomfort. She just wasn't used to it at that time. So she eventually learned that even when I pick up the reins, that it's actually OK and it's comfortable and, and she can actually move around and, and do things. Um, she doesn't have to be in Arabian all the time with with her face in the air. So, you know, it was a little bit of patience. Some days it worked, some days it didn't. It took a little bit of time, but that was definitely one of the things that I did with her. And then I would say as well, you know, when you're talking about contact and trying to capture the collection, hot horses are great at learning collection stuff because like they're on fire, like they, they got things to do. Um, we just need to get that again, where I say sort of direct the energy. We need to direct the energy so it's not in the front half of the body, but it's actually in the back half of the body. So for example, you know, when they're collected, you know, they need to be like this. This is their bum, this is their head. They're a little bit like sitting, okay? They're sitting in a chair almost with their bum. So we need to direct their energy so that it's back here. It's in their bum. And then that way, it's more sort of light and free in the front. So they can take those big steps. Like Lily, the second that she, you know, we started doing um, working with contact and more collection, she learned extended trot. And now, like, that's her go to, like, when she wants to show off to people because she does the most beautiful, floaty, extended trot on earth. Um, but, you know, it took her a little while to kind of get there. And, and once her, her weight was there, she learned, you know, she's taking these big, powerful steps. That's why her extended trot is so nice. Her legs are just so free in the front because all of the energy is directed from behind, pushing forward. So she's actually not going very fast. So when I'm, she's so adjustable in the extended trot that I can ask her to go into that extension and then just before the corner, bring her back. And I mean like that, she's already sitting because you know I've directed the energy from behind. So it's, and you know, she, she really enjoys that when I'm doing the extended trot, she really enjoys that kind of ability to show off, but also that ability to move and to actually feel free and to feel like she can use the power that she has. So I would also say with your horse, you know, try and give them exercises. Maybe it's the extended trot, but try and give your horse some exercises where they feel like they can, like they're allowed to move and do those kind of fancy things. Um, you know, have them do the extended trot, have them do, um, I don't know, whatever it is that your horse enjoys doing and have them do, maybe she prefers like an extended canter. So you do an extended canter down the long side and then you bring her back in the corners. Maybe, you know, if your horse is a little bit further along, maybe there's a certain exercise or something that they just like really like, I love doing that. I love doing the half pass or I love it when I'm jumping or whatever it is. And then you can kind of, direct their energy so that you can kind of encourage them to do those exercises while still at the same time maintaining their rhythm and staying relaxed and calm. The second that they start to get like too hyper or too excited, um, you know, so for example, if you were jumping, um, maybe you were having them very relaxed and calm the first three jumps and around jump four, they start to get too excited, then make a circle. You're done for the day. You don't even have to jump jump number four, okay, if you're not in a horse show. So, you know, finish finish that day with three jumps, you know, maybe work up to, to jumping the full course. So yeah, hopefully hopefully that answered your question. I know that was kind of a long, long-winded answer there. Um, but that is definitely something that I that I did with Lily, which which might help you. So let's see if there are any other questions. Whew, okay. Don't see any other questions. Well, thank you guys so much for, for watching. And hopefully this topic, again, like I said, has been helpful. Um, feel free to, to shoot me an email. If you want to join one of my private mastermind, like group calls, then again, send me an email, let me know. And I'm happy for you to jump in and audit. And that way we can have more face-to-face -face contact and actually 
have time to answer your questions a little bit more uh, personally and give you actual exercises and it can be a bit more of a discussion. So yeah, thank you so much. And I will see you guys next week at the next um, session. So Kara says, thank you. All right. Well, enjoy your day.